Today's session is on the application of Good Shepherd Position Paper on, on the Prostitution of Women and Girls to Programs and Projects. Um, and I'm Teresa. So the purpose of today's session is to link and deepen the application of this paper to our programs. We will have a moment of reflection on ourselves and on the program. And also we will hear voices from the field, uh, from Philippines and Thailand. As with all our other webinars, the principle of this webinar is all of us who are gathered here, all of you who are participants to this webinar, you are the experts on the ground. And this session is a guide to mission effectiveness. It is a, a guide, but you are the ones that um, have the uh, expertise on the ground. Then we also will have hopefully through this session, integrate spirituality and justice and peace with good ministry practices. Be cognizant of why we are driven and what motivates us as Good Shepherd people to work with uh, women in prostitution. And also we will talk about the human rights based approach. I bring you back to this diagram and to the many times when we have looked at this. Um, and all individual human beings, including including the girl child and including women and children who are in prostitution, are rights holders. Are rights holders. Those rights are codified in the UN International Covenants and Conventions. Empowerment of rights holders to claim their rights. That's what we do as Good Shepherd. And we also have all rights have corresponding duty bearers, state and state actors, who are responsible in fulfilling the corresponding rights in a given context. Accountability of duty bearers to fulfill those rights. And so as Good Shepherd, our programs address the capacity gaps between the rights holders and the duty bearers. And how do we empower the rights holders, in this case, which are women and girls uh, who are involved, who are in prostitution or prostituted women and girls, and how do we empower them um, to claim their rights, to have alternative livelihood programs and to uh, restore their dignity. In the session that Winifred shared with us, we heard about this. What is prostitution? Prostitution is a system. Sometimes it is referred to as the oldest profession in the world, but as Good Shepherd, we say no, it is the oldest oppression in the world. And we also heard how important language is. Is there a difference in meaning between using the word prostitute and prostituted girl or woman? Do we say I work with prostitutes or she is a prostitute versus I work with prostituted girls and women. There is a difference. And we need to be clear as Good Shepherd where our stand lies. I will talk a little bit further about this because this is really very important. We also heard a question that Winifred posed to us um, in her session. Herein lies the debate that causes the difficulty. Is prostitution work? or violence? Is prostitution a profession or oppression? Good Shepherd Position Paper, Paragraph 2. Prostitution is never part of a decent work agenda. Sex work is the term used today for prostitution as a profession, a job, having re labor regulations and health and safety standards. The term sex work proposes to be non-discriminatory, but in fact, it normalizes violence against girls and women. Now, when we look at this slide itself, we have to be very clear as Good Shepherd, what our thinking process is, where, how do we see um, pro prostitution? Because herein lies our focus for the position paper and herein lies how we move forward as Good Shepherd. In the opening paragraph of the position paper, the prostitution of women and girls 
is an ancient form of gender violence that is structurally embedded in societies. It is a form of subjugation, suppression, coercion, enslavement. I, I did this slide so that we are clear that within the discourse of uh, prostitution, there are varying narratives. And we need to be very clear where our narrative lies and how do we carry ourselves when we work with women uh, who are in prostitution, when we network with NGOs who um, are, vo are the voice for women in prostitution. We need to be very clear. So on the left, we have this narrative that prostitution is not work. And the narrative and how we call uh, women and girls in prostitution would be prostituted women and girls or women and girls in prostitution. We say it's a violation of human rights and fundamental obstacle to gender equality. And we recognize root causes as drivers into prostitution. And when we take the stand that prostitution is not work, we advocate for abolitionism and neo-abolitionism. And in the session that Winifred gave us, we had a very large discourse on the five different models, legislation models that are present in different countries. Next, we look at the other discourse, which is the recognition of prostitution as work, lobbying for the rights of sex workers within the human rights framework, promotes prostitution as dignified work agenda, as a choice women make. So in this discourse, we have the legislation of prostitution. That means prostitution becomes legalized in different countries. And we have the de decriminalization of sex trade, which is, means the same thing, that prostitution becomes legalized in these different countries. So what is the Good Shepherd stand? This is where Good Shepherd lies. And I like this symbol, which is drawn by love, passionate for justice, the theme for our next congregation chapter. And we need to ask ourselves, if we are networking with other NGOs, if we are coming into collaboration to do greater networking, networking for, to advocate for the rights of women and girls, where do we align ourselves? Who do we align ourselves with? The position on the right? or the position on the left. We need to be very clear. If you hear a drilling sound um, as I speak, it is because I'm living in an apartment and they are fixing the CCTV cameras in the corridors at the moment. So I apologize for this sound. I have to speak above this sound. Um, I just want to share with you when I started work in Good Shepherd. I do... Um, were calling women and girls who were involved in prostitution as prostitutes because it was a normal narrative. Normal narrative in all that I saw in printed literature, in media, in movies. It's the, norm, um, it's the normal narrative for addressing women and girls who were in prostitution. When I started to work in Good Shepherd, and then I realized that, hey, we work with women um, who are involved in prostitution and that we are looking at them in a different way, in a different narrative. And then I started working and networking with uh, NGOs who are also involved in, in advocating for women and girls. And they were calling uh, women who were prostituted as sex workers. And I was like thinking to myself, mm, what, is my, what is my own narrative? how do I also align myself uh, to what is happening? Are they also sex workers in my mind? And I read, then I read the position papers and I had to ask myself, what is my own thinking? Where am I coming from? What is society saying? And more importantly, what is Good Shepherd saying? How do we place women and girls 
in the center of our discourse. And so at this point, I just want to share this article that I found in The Guardian that says prostitution is not a job. The inside of a woman's body is not a workplace. And in this article, it talks about New Zealand having added sex work to its list of skills for migrants, adding to the normalization of the use of vulnerable women's bodies. Before we go further, I would just like to engage you in this poll. Have you ever met or spoken to a woman, a prostituted girl or woman? I'm going to launch the poll now. And I invite you to just complete your response. 110 said yes, they have spoken or met a woman who is prostituted. 10% said maybe. And 19% said no. Thank you very much for that sharing. Next question. Describe in one word how you felt when you met a prostituted woman or girl. And you can see the word sad coming across. Pity, compassion, angry. disturbed, sympathetic, want to help them out, lonely, empathy, compassion, very sad, people are still posting, empathic, I see devastated, unfair. Thank you very much. And we'll take a screenshot of this. In the position paper, under paragraph one, we have the root causes of prostitution. At this point, I would like to just share what the effects are when we work, when we see, when we experience women in prostitution. That is the criminalization of women. That means um, women are treated as, as perpetrators rather than as victims. Post-traumatic stress disorder. If you do a research on uh, women in prostitution and PTSD, you will find that there are many uh, research papers on the effects of prostitution on women uh, and how they experience post-traumatic stress disorder many years after they leave, um, after they exit prostitution. And it is very difficult for them to overcome this PTSD. We also uh, realize that substance abuse, alcohol, drugs, and smoking, and this is to, is to help the women cope uh, with what they're experiencing. And limited livelihood options. We have poor, poor self-esteem, shame, or inferiority. History of childhood sexual and physical abuse. In the last session, we heard Super Porn share about this. In the experiences in Pattaya, there was a history, uh, most of the women had a history of childhood um, sexual and physical abuse. There's double life, drifting life, always on the move and poor living conditions that these women experience. There was a story I read where a woman comes home and, um, and she, she, she doesn't let um, the people at home know the profession or what she has done. So when she comes back, she changes her clothes, she washes everything. It's, it's like as though she is living two different lives. Women in prostitution are vulnerable to trafficking or they have been trafficked into prostitution. There's social discrimination. Of course, there are health issues, multiple health issues. 
dysfunctional families, and sexual and other forms of gender-based violence. So these are some of the effects that we see of prostitution. What are the root causes of prostitution? There's poverty, male privilege, demand by men for women to be available for sexual purchase, patriarchy, inadequate family support, political structures and systems that devalue women, militarization, racist attitudes, ecological degradation, degradation, sorry, extreme wealth, economic systems within globalized economy that result in women in extreme poverty. So we see this as root causes of prostitution. And how do we respond to this scenario that we see? If we look at the top part of the screen, where we see the leaves and the branches, that are the effects. And normally in our work with women in prostitution or prostituted women and girls, our response, and this is taken from the Good Shepherd Position Paper, paragraphs four and five, is to express solidarity, to listen to the experiences, accompany in personal journeys, and develop with them programs that meet their needs. Interventions which heal, promote self-sufficiency through employable skills, economic and personal growth opportunities, and reconciliation with often estranged families. Education on human rights, trauma awareness practices, and economic empowerment as foundational approaches. So when we look at this in our response to women who are experiencing violence into prostitution, it is important that we have these different uh, responses that come from our position paper. And if we look at this response, we are addressing, we are addressing the effects of prostitution. We are addressing the effects. We are addressing what we see as a result of women and girls in prostitution. Okay, I show you the screen again. This addresses the effects. We are not yet addressing the root causes. We are not yet addressing the root causes. When we look at this, family, community, society, position paper, paragraph two and six, Prostitution is incompatible with the dignity and worth of the human person and endangers the welfare of the individual, the family, and the community. This is taken from the 1949 convention, the UN convention. We will see this convention later on. So when we talk about family, community, and society, we have to be active educators of communities of the, on the dignity of girls and women promote analysis of attitudes and traditional practices, including male sexual initiation in society. Critic early marriage and honor marriage. Be critical, yeah? Talk on safe migration, gender discrimination, unrestrained consumerism, economic and patriarchal systems, and feminization of poverty. It is important when we do our outreach programs when we work with family, community, and the society at large, that we talk, we take all these into consideration. Even if we are not specifically working on the issue of prostituted women and girls, when we talk to our children in school, when we uh, do our programs on um, 16 Day of No Violence to Women and Girls, how do we educate communities on the dignity of girls and women? Analyze attitudes and traditional practices including male sexual initiation in society, et cetera, et cetera. It's important that we do this to address family, community, and society at large. When we do this, we are to a certain extent addressing root causes, which has got male privilege, 
demand by men for women to be available for sexual purchase, racist attitudes, patriarchy, family support, etc., etc. Now I go to country and international. Holding the country accountable. Good Shepherd Position Paper, Paragraph 6. Know the position of your country. What is the legislation model of your country with regards to prostitution? We heard Winifred share that there are five different legislation models. Abolitionism, neo-abolitionism, legislation, decriminalization, and prohibition. What is your, where is your country in relation to the 1949 Convention of the Suppression of Traffic in Persons and the Exploitation of the Prostitution of Others? CEDAW Article 6 the CRC, the Palermo Protocol on Human Trafficking, Sustainable develop, Development Goals, especially 5 and 8.3. Condemn state sponsorship of prostitution. Reject legalization of prostitution. Promote abolitionism and neo-abolitionism. Actively network with others for greater advocacy. Actively contribute to policy formation. So hopefully this will address the root causes of prostitution. So when we look at the ecological structure or the framework that surrounds a program participant, our activities and our outputs and outcomes and impact must address all the different levels um, that affect a prostituted girl or woman. All right? I will share the slides with you later. So when we look at prostitution, migration, and human trafficking, all three are interrelated with women and girls, um, impacting women and girls. The next position paper that we will do will be on economic justice, and after that, on um, integral ecology. We will see how all the position papers are interrelated. So if we work on human trafficking, we will also experience women and girls who are exploited for sex. When we work on issues of migration, we will see the movement of women and girls coming into different countries as destination countries um, and being prostituted in those countries. So at this point, I would like to invite Meli Lanario, who is currently a social worker with Welcome House in Cebu, to share with us her experiences of being a survivor um, of sex trafficking. And Melly was, a, was, an, was an activist, a survivor activist, when she spoke at the UN in 2018 and again in 2019. I will now stop sharing my screen and invite Melly to share with us her experiences and why she is now with Good Shepherd. I invite you at this point to put on your speaker view so that you can hear um, Melly, and I will make um, Melly the co-host so that she can share screen. Melly, you can unmute yourself. Good morning, Melly. Thank you so much for being available to share with us your experiences. And as Melly shares, um, after her sharing, we will have a short moment of uh, questions uh, for Melly. So as she shares, I invite you, if you have any questions, uh, to take down your questions so that you can share, you can ask her later. And I ask everyone to mute your, to mute your mics. Mute Okay, uh, thank you very much for inviting me for this very special uh, gathering. And <clears throat> I am Meli Linario, a survivor advocate from Metro Cebu City, Philippines. Just last March, I graduated Bachelor of Science in Social Work at the same time. I am employed full-time at the Religious of the Good Shepherd Sisters in one of their center catering women and girls who are victims of human trafficking. 
When I was still a partner participant in the Good Shepherd Welcome House, me and the other survivors were trained as a peer educators. At the time, I was uh, still a partner participant, so I have to undergo uh, a lot of trainings, series of trainings for me to be able to discover myself, to understand about my life. And of course, it is also a part of the healing process when I was still a, a participant in the Good Shepherd Welcome House. In one of the uh, uh, training I attended is, and also the other for educators, is the nonviolent communication. It was really helped me to, to understand the way of communicating women, how we interact with them, and the language that we use. And all this training equipped me to discover, understand myself, to become a better person, and how am I going to help others. And one of the night, the highlights, we had to do an exposure in the different areas, and I was assigned the area where I was being trafficked. That time, I was with Sister Tonette and Brother Paul. I was just observing and listening while talking to the girls. I couldn't imagine myself went back to the place where my life was ruined. And as I remember, one of the activity in our peer educators training, Marietta Latonio and Miss Grisel asked us that what can you see about yourself five years from now? I quickly responds that I will be a social worker at that time. From that one night exposure in the red lights, I was very touched. At the same time, I said to myself, that I want to be of help, especially to those women and girls who have experienced human trafficking like me. And that was the turning point and aspired me to continue work with the Villa Maria Good Shepherd Sister to reach out women and girls in the community, bikini bars and in the streets. I describe myself as an advocate who helps women who are still in the red lights. Four nights a week, I and the six other survivors visit different areas to talk with girls, greet them, build a relationship, and tell them about our program and services in the center. We conduct orientation in the different bars, hygiene clinic in the Department of the City Health to those from the community and in the street. We invite and encourage them to visit the center to have rest. At the same time, we conduct awareness on human trafficking, HIV awareness, reproductive health, VAUSI, child's right, recreational activities, spiritual activities, and assist women and girls for hygiene checkup. I listen to these women and girls during every visit. I become emotional about their stories, or I would say that we have common stories but different experience of abuses. And this becomes one of the challenges on how we can address their needs. Some girls first into prostitution to support their children. A sales lady become prostituted because her contract in the department store ends. Young girls support their siblings because their parents are into drugs. Other abused by their family who are supposed to protect them and etc. These are just few of the stories I listened to, and I know these stories are not only in the Philippines, but
but all over the world. As a survivor advocate, when talking about prevention, access to, so, access to social protection is a big opportunity for women and girls to be helped and overcome their vulnerability in the different exploitative situations, especially human trafficking into sexual explo exploitation. I hope the human trafficking comes to an end. I appeal to the public, to the whole world, that survivors shall be accepted in the community without being discriminated and also social justice be provided to them. They will be heard and included in the discussions that pertain to their own welfare so that they will empower themselves to become the decision makers of their lives. These survivors and their children, if they have, will be provided access to the government services to prevent them from further exploitation. Assess the survivors to their plans to have a better quality of life, providing well-balanced and appropriate protective services. Design a realistic way of tracking the changes in the survivor's life as basis of monitoring on what works well and what needs more to be done. Inclusions of women survivors in partnership and collaborative efforts, it is in the government or other sectors of the society. All this time, I fully committed to myself work with the Bilia Maria Gutschieper sisters as one of their fruits. I am always grateful and it's always good to, say, to pay back for all their support, especially to Sister Dina Manansan, who inspired me to finish my study so I can help to those who are in needs. I will continue to be a voice for those voiceless and be sure of breaking the silence. And before my, I end my topic, I am always inspired St. Mary Euphrasia by her quotes. A person of, is of more value than the whole world. Indeed, it relates my life that despite of all my struggles and difficulties in this world, I can say that I have a value as a person, same with the women and girls who are victims of human trafficking. Thank you for letting me share. Thank you so much, Melly. Thank you so much. I request that, um, yes, thank you for stop, stopping, uh, for stop sharing screen, yes. Uh, thank you so much. I see lots of reactions, uh, hands clapping, thumbs up sign. Um, we hear from Melly how she is now a survivor advocate and um, how she has moved from one position to another and now she is working with women who are prostituted. And we hear also all the different programs that Welcome House has. And we hear of Melly's commitment um, to what she's doing. So we want to thank Melly. And at this point, I just want to invite anyone who has a question, either you can post it in the chat box or you can raise your hands and I will invite you to, um, to, to share your question. Yes. Let me see. We have Teresa Kang. We have Teresa Kang. Can you unmute yourself and then just share with us your question? Teresa, are you there? Teresa, come. Okay, we have uh, Marta. Marta from Indonesia. Marta, do you have a question? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. The first thing that I want to say is big thanks for Melly, such a 
inspirational story. It's a really wonderful story. And I am so interested in women empowerment in peer educator training. I want to know, really want to know how the dynamics of women empowerment in there and what the most meaningful and what the most uh, meaningful moment, meaningful experience uh, in that training. Yeah, in women empowerment. Okay, so during, during before that one, as I have said that we have conducted series of uh, training, especially the self-awareness, uh, resiliency, like that one. And so that one, because of that one, uh, each one of us, we really know each other, what are our weaknesses, what are the uh, possibility of understanding each other. And so that one, because of that women empowerment, uh, uh, it's all of us is really the goal the goal of, of one of us the goal is to help for other women who are in the red light so that's the most important because if we didn't understand our especially myself and my co uh, peer educators that will be very difficult also to 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 work with women so uh, the important thing there is uh, uh, I also know uh, my peer educators, what is her uh, weaknesses. So I have to encourage her that this is the, the kind, this is the best thing that we do. We, we advise each other like that. Thank you, Melly. So what I hear Melly saying is that um, to be an effective peer educator, we really need to know ourselves and really need to know each other so that we can journey better together. And um, Melly, um, we will make your slides available. Is it possible uh, that you share your slides with me so that I can share with uh, the people who have participated in today's program? Okay. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And is that, is that all right, Martha? I also encourage yeah. you to link thank directly so to Melly. Yes. yes. All right, all right. Yes. yes, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, yes, thank you. Just to share that the you heard the the program at Welcome House, they have both residential and outreach programs. We have one thank question. You. Thank here. you so much for the answer also. Yes. Thank you, Martha. Thank you for asking. You're welcome. Thank you also. We have one question in the chat box that asks what is the meaning of feminization of poverty? Um, what it means is that the gap, the, when we talk about feminization of poverty, it refers to the increasing inequality between, um, the, the, uh, between men and women and how that gap of uh, the poverty gap between men and women increases as development and globalization continues. So that means feminization of poverty that women become um, subject to extreme poverty. And that is the drive, one of the drivers uh, that lead women to look for alternative uh, sources of income. And one of them would be, uh, they become prostituted. Okay, so that is the meaning of feminization of poverty. So if uh, we have no more questions for Melly, I, so One, two. One question from uh, Sister Mira from Southwest India. Ah, okay. She posted in the chat a common belief which is expressed by many is that it is difficult for the women victimized to come back. What do you say? This is for Melly to. Yeah. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Veronica. Hi, Melly. Hi, Melly. Do you have a response to this? The question, can you repeat the question again, Veronica? Yeah, uh, a common belief which is expressed by many is that it is difficult for the women victimized to come back, what do you say? 
Thank you, Lady. Ah, okay. Uh, uh, for us as a peer educator, uh, uh, it is it because of all these trainings. It is really a uh, uh, one of the the effect that uh, it is uh, one of the lessons that uh, uh, it's it's maybe hard to it's maybe hard to working on ourselves, especially in the healing process. But this is one way. This training. This is one way. It is an awareness that uh, we are not uh, easily get back or be, uh, be re-victimized re again because of all these trainings and uh, we are always aware in this one, like that. Thank you. Thank you, Meli. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there is another question here, and this will be the last question for this session because we can take questions after as well. What were the push and pull factors that really helped you to get out? Okay. Uh, when, when I was still in, in the red lights, uh, uh, it was Brother Paul and Father Heinz who always visited me in the area. And so they always encouraged me to, to visit the center no, of the Good Shepherd Sisters. And so at the time, it's like, I don't believe. But then later on, uh, I just woke up and then I said, maybe it's true that Father Heinz and Brother Paul, yeah, that I still have a chance to study. So that was the turning point that I really want to get out from that uh, uh, situation. Thank you, Meli. Thank you for sharing. And for all of us who are in this webinar at this point, um, I also, we also have a video of Meli who shared her story in 2018 at the UN. And within that story, you will hear how Meli um, um, was rescued and how uh, she became involved in the Good Shepherd program. And, and I didn't want her to share that part again because it was already uh, in the video and not to you know, recount uh, stories um, that were tra traumatic for Meli. So thank you so much, Meli. Um, at, at this point, we will move on. Um, I will share screen again. We will move on to um, Sister Michelle Lopez. Um, Michelle um, was instrumental together with a Buddhist nun um, whose name was Kuhn. Both Michelle and Kuhn in 1998 uh, started work with prostituted girls and women in Thailand. And you can see the story of how the Fountain of Life in Pattaya started uh, through this link that is at the bottom of the screen. Yeah, so I would now like to ask, uh, invite Michelle uh, to share the story of the founding of Pattaya. So Michelle, I will make you co-host. So, yes, please go ahead. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Michelle, for sharing. Uh, so for those who don't know, a little bit of introduction as to Pattaya, where the program is situated. Uh, Pattaya is a sex tourism city, and the government is now trying to change that negative image and try to give it a positive image. And there are redemptorist priests working here. They run uh, orphanages and uh, homes for the disabled and they saw the situation of the women and they invited Good Shepherd. So Euphrasia and I went and did the field work in the beginning. And after that, uh, officially Fountain of Life began in August 1989. You know, and the Redemptorist Fathers, they gave us uh, and the, the people who worked with me officially, I began this program with an ex-Buddhist nun. Her name is Kun Lampa. And later on, another very powerful woman came and joined me, and that is Joan Raper. And I'll talk about her a little, little later on. 
And then we started this program and the Redemptorists, they gave us um, a, a used building, an, an old building. And this old building was two buffaloes. It was actually a bar and it was called two buffaloes. And Joan Raper and myself, we talked together and the council and we changed two buffaloes into a fountain of life. So the interesting thing is we have a center right in the midst of the red light district, right in the midst. It could be called, it actually now in hindsight, I would say it was a blessing in disguise. So what do you do with the center? And a, an ex-Buddhist nun who, has, who is so pure, what do you do? The only thing, the, there was only one option for us, and that was exposure. You know, that by exposure, I mean going right out and seeing what's happening in the context of Pattaya. And the exposure, and I was not prepared for the shock that the exposure was going to provide. Here we saw the commodification, you know, human people commodified, the commodification of human people. We saw the messiness of life, the dismemberment of the human body and the sale of sex. And strange enough, people from different countries in the world were enjoying what they saw. Very often people ask me, you know, what's the inspiration that led you to this approach? And, uh, you know, it's not like a beautiful angel coming and telling me, you know, giving a secret to me. It was not like that. The exposure, once you are exposed, you know, there is no turning back. And the exposure forcefully dragged me into another phase of the journey. I call it the immersion journey. And in the immersion journey, by this I mean going out every night to the bars, working with them every night from 6 p.m. to 2 a.m., empowering the women, teaching them English and other things about uh, safe sex and all these kind of things, and also being criticized by some people, you know, who said, oh, you're trying to make them better, you know, in their job. I mean, today we would call it capacity building, you know, but that days we, in the 1980s, we didn't have capacity building. So they used to say, you know, the, being criticized for doing things like this. But as I said, you know, we were out working and somebody at home, you know, in this, in this old buildings, Joan Raper was waiting and praying for us that nothing would happen. So I have great honor and respect for Joan Raper. And later on, another Irish sister, this Joan Raper is from Australia, and later on, another Irish sister from Ireland, Eileen Dalton, who has gone to God. And, but something happened, you know, during these interviews and while I was in immersion. The dialogue of life began. And you know, the dialogue of life is such an important thing because once you are close to reality, it's a very easy way to check the authenticity of my, mess my witnessing, the authenticity of my message, and the authenticity of my actions. So from exposure, I moved to immersion. And as I said, you know, with exposure and emotion, the immersion, they develop the spirituality of immersion programs. There was nothing else that could happen, you know. Once you're exposed, you're forced into immersion, and then you have the immersion programs. And by immersion programs, as I said earlier on, there is this dialogue of life. And it was a very humbling experience because we were given the permission by our women to dialogue with them, you know, and to hear their stories. And we were challenged by the messiness of life and the concept of morality. It had to be redefined for us. And there was a great shift 
that was happening at the same time. You know, from helping from the institution, we were now shifting and moving to helping and empowering people in their situation. And speaking from the perspective of the women now became the way of life. You know, not from the perspective of the institution. And finally, I would like to, you know, say that there's one more thing that I felt which was very important. In our Christian tradition, we call it apostolic mobility. It simply means, you know, the readiness to move on. And when the time is ripe, then I'm ready to let go and move on because there are others who are able to take on the mission and continue to revision the mission according to each context. And I know that this is happening. And so to honor them, I would like to let you all know that we received the Good Citizens Reward. Now, this is a reward that was given to us for the work we did in anti-trafficking of children in the whole of the Mekong region. It was given to us. And at present, our sisters and partners and staff who, uh, who work in the Women's Center, they have a strong voice in influencing policy at the province level. So that's my sharing for today. Thank you so much, Michelle. Thank you so much. It was such a, a deep sharing. Thank you for sharing about moving from exposure to immersion, to dialogue of life, and then to the immersion programs. And thank you for fleshing out the rights-based approach there where the women and the experiences are at the center and not the Good Shepherd Institution. Thank you so much for that. And um, thank you also for sharing about systemic change at policy level and at um, legislation level. Thank you so much. I now um, invite anyone who has a question for Michelle to either say your name uh, and voice your question or to type in the chat group. or even a reaction uh, if it's not a question. We see many reactions up, you know, um, thumbs up, clapping and all that. Maybe at this point, uh, we have Joan Raper with us in the audience as well, as one of the participants. I would like to invite Joan to also say a few words. Um, Joan, I've made you co-host so that you can unmute yourself. Um, and share with us your experiences in Pattaya. Oh, thank you very much indeed. And it's just a thrill for me to listen to Michelle today because I worked with Michelle for nearly two years in Pattaya and to set up the centre. And Michelle was outstanding. She is just so zealous, so prayerful, and so much words that come to mind for me today are with Michelle, one person is of more value than a world. What she did for the many individual girls in the centre was truly amazing. And I felt it was a great privilege to work with Michelle and to imbibe her zeal and her spirituality. So I think we all owe Michelle a great deal. And I'm thrilled to be here now and listening to all of this. For I loved my time in Pattaya. And if only I could have learnt the language, it's not all that easy, you know, Thai. <laughs> and my health didn't give in, I'd still be there today. But lots of love and thanks to Michelle. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Joan. Thank you for, for sharing your reflection. Thank you so much. I see we don't have any questions in the chat box. 
um, and we don't have anyone who has stepped forward yet to say that they have a question. We will take questions maybe at the end then. Michelle, would you like me to, um, would you like to end with the psalm? Okay, let me uh, share screen again. And here we are, Michelle. Go ahead. So th this was, I have to explain a little bit about the psalm. And this was a psalm that we composed, taking it from Psalm 13. And we prayed this psalm, okay? So do I, I read it, Teresa? Okay. How long, O oh Lord, will you utterly forget me? How long will I experience your apparent absence? How long am I to carry pain in my body, sorrow in my soul, as I cry out to you, night after night. How long will the bar owners triumphantly use and abuse me? Notice me, look at my broken body, O oh Lord my God. Enlighten my drooping eyes that I may not fall asleep in death. That my exploiters may not say, we have subdued her with our money. That my owners will not exalt over my economic productivity. Yes, I, your little one, I trust in your faithfulness. My heart is at peace even in darkness. I want to sing to you, O oh Lord, for you understand my anguish, anguish, and you will rescue me. Seven. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. That was really lovely. Thank you so much. I will now um, move on to the next part of our session. Society socially distances themselves from women and girls who are engaged in prostitution. As Good Shepherd people, we need to examine our own perceptions and social constructs of women in prostitution, women and girls in prostitution, before we can begin to journey with them in a rights-based approach. We need to examine our own blind spots. This next part, I invite you to go into breakout rooms and we will share how was I socialized or brought up to view women and girls in prostitution? How does this sit with a good, good shepherd position paper on prostitution? What do I need to let go of? And what do I need to relearn? Where do I need input or help? And we have a third question which I did not put up on the PowerPoint. What more can we do as good shepherd people? to address this phenomena of prostitution of uh, women and girls. So I will stop sharing my screen now. Can you see my screen? Yes. yes. Okay, great, great. I'll make, a big, make it bigger a bit. No. You can't see? Can, Teresa. Can, okay, great. So let me see, how do I make my screen? Okay, let's see now. How was I brought up or socialized to view women in prostitution? Uh, we have 31 responses. <coughs> Important to have exposure to know women, to go out and explore the world. Uh, it is oppression and they need to come out. Don't understand at first, but after joining Good Shepherd understood why there is uh, a need to do this. This is a very important revelation, yeah? Few of us considered them as bad women, but later realized that it is the situation that brought them into this. Look down on them and told not to talk to them and to look <coughs> as they are considered bad. Look, as look upon as shallow women. They were rejected, they are sinners, they are bad people. 
just numb that it's existed before it entered the world, brought up to feel sorry for the women, not exposed to prostituted women or the word prostitute. See, prostitution is not a good work to support the family. Thank you for your honest sharings, yeah? No experience during childhood, lowly. Uh, survivors are treated badly. Women in prostitution are seen as sinners, are bad, untouchable outcasts. I think this is, in summary, <clears throat> some of the responses that we have. And it just shows the socialization and our own socialization of how we look at women who are, who are prostituted and how society views them and how we ourselves, when before we came into Good Shepherd, um, had the same uh, kind of um, views and perception. Okay. Looked at as a commodity, women are dehumanized, not seen as human beings yet. What do I need to let go of and what do I need to relearn? Where do I need input or help? To let go of comfort zone, we need time. Women can be taught with skills for both men and women. Let go of attitude towards them, which is a negative approach. We have to shift in our understanding that it's not their choice, but rather we are responsible and that many forces have led them to this. When possible, listen to them without judging. Treat them with dignity. Respect with dignity and honor. Not to go with biases, as persons are entitled to all dignity. Lead me to be an activist. Let go of, um, let, let go of change of mindset and change my own thinking. Let go of prejudice, know the background. Let go of fear of losing myself when faced with difficulty. How can I help? That's a good question. Let go of doubts of the women. Need to relearn the root cause. Need to relearn the root cause. Let go of societal mindset. Let go of attitude towards women. Let go of my idea of these women as bad. Let go of biases. Thank you so much for your sharing. It's very honest and it's very deep. And if we look at this, it really starts with ourselves. My perception about women, my ideas and views, from my experience, I learned that I need to be aware of the situations in my country. Let go of childhood idea of women in prostitution. Let go of prejudice, blaming people for their circumstance. Fear, let go of my comfort zone of being closed. Okay, what do I need to relearn? Let go of mindset, let go of narrow mindset. Okay, thank you so much. Now this part is very important because it will help us to ask ourselves, what can we do in our units? Uh, what more can we do? Involvement of men and create awareness. Networking with Asia-Pacific region. Change of mindsets. Join with like-minded NGOs and government of, uh, offices. Um, need to have a common platform to share views and networking and partnership. Challenge the system, speak for them, contribute to the position papers. Thank you very much. Prostitution is not a profession, but a form of oppression. Connect and cooperate with sector to create industry for job opportunities for women and girls, teach them skills, increase in education. And very, very important is sensitization of boys and men. Have more dialogue with UN agencies, address root causes, empowerment of women with programs like capacity development, strengthen policies and advocacy, accompaniment, design creative programs, strengthen and maintain the quality of service for them, we have networking, more awareness on human trafficking, design programs for young people in their country of origin, very important. How do we educate people on safe migration, yeah? Adopt the one person is of more value than the whole world motto, very good. We can raise awareness and do advocacy about their rights, awareness programs, looking at different angles, empower women to step forward, encourage to shed the habit and wear civil clothes. Be more zealous, educate ourselves, talk about sex and sexuality and abuse more openly. Solidarity, generate hope, break barriers, generate alternate opportunities for livelihood. I'm, as I read this, I'm so reminded by Melly and Michelle sharing of how we need to enter into the shoes of the other. 
and how we need to immerse ourselves. And if you hear Melly, she said, we can only be as good as how we are entering into the shoes of the other. And it's very important when we look at what more Good Shepherd can do. If you look at these responses, it says the same thing. How do we create awareness? And I want to challenge each of us to go on an exposure program, to immerse ourselves in the issues. I'm going to stop sharing screen here. And we're going to have, um, it's already uh, one hour and 45 minutes into our session. I'm just going to invite any responses from the audience, any responses that you may have or any insights. Let's have a, maybe a five minute open forum for discussion. Anyone, just feel free. I come in, Teresa? Yes, please go ahead. Um, so uh, I believe that it's uh, really time for um, Good Shepherd to uh, follow in the footsteps of Joan Raper and Michelle uh, and uh, to get out of that institution of the buildings and the projects and uh, mode to shift mentality and uh, to, to be available to women and girls are more available. There are many who are already doing it, but uh, especially with the deep impact of globalization of of the pandemic, there are many, many uh, hundreds of women and girls on the street and uh, that courage to support each other because this is not easy work. So uh, we need more inspirational stories, more courage, more solidarity to be out there uh, with the girls uh, on the street, the women on the street. Thank you so much, Arlene. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that call. Uh, to move out of our comfort zones yeah, and to be immersed in uh, where it matters the most. Um, I think Martha raised her hand. Martha from Indonesia. Yeah, thank you. Um, from this meeting, i really uh, inspired by how, like Melly says, if we want to empower women and uh, as women, we, I think majority of us is as women you know and we need to empower each other rather than look down each other and uh, the key is how we can increase our compassion in how we can uh, take take the compassion and the motto like uh, a person is more value than the whole world into the practice into the reality within the bene our beneficiaries within the uh, services and I have inside that uh, our compassion how we look other women and how we empower each other is really related to uh, ego from from ego to echo because we need to let go something that burden us to uh, give a more chances, opportunity, and give more a uh, love and compassion to each other, especially in our services. Thank. Thank you, Martha. Thank you for the call um, to compassion and. Um, we realize that as we practice open mind, open heart, and open will, and which leads into open action, that we need to engage curiosity. That means it starts first with our mind. How curious are we with this topic? And how do we want to engage in this topic um, cognitively as well? You know? And then the second stage would be, how are we moved to compassion? You know, the open heart space. And the third is, how do we master our courage to go and do something, you know, and that would mean how do we overcome the fear when we reach the open wheel stage, you know, and how do we activate the, the curiosity, the compassion so that we have courage to move. Um, I want to invite uh, Salome now to, um, to react. Salome? Uh, yeah. We, yeah. Yes. Um, in, in our group, we were also discussing, you know, um, besides what was sh um, shared on screen, about this uh, different forms of prostitution that's happening, this online prostitution, and um, how aware are we in this 
you know, uh, ways that, you know, the uh, traffickers or people who go into this uh, or forced into this, you know, and how are we as Good Shepherd going to respond to this needs that is, has evolved, uh, I mean, has evolved. We can't just go with our previous, you know, knowledge, but we also have to adapt according to, accordingly our approaches and call for different, but we need to be really know what's happening online, the different forms, and we have to really get into this IT thing to know what's happening. Yeah, that, that's just my, react, my reaction. Thank you so much, Salome. And as we hear Salome share, it really starts with ourselves. And how do we move from ego to ego? How do we look at ourselves first, engage a curiosity attitude to want to know more? Because if we say, I will wait for someone else to start and then I will join, it may not happen. But how do we, each of us, if we are able to come onto Zoom, 144 of us, that means we have access to internet, we have access to a lot of information on Google. All you have to do is type in a search and you will find your answers and we need to cultivate that curiosity. Um, I've got Flora from Indonesia as the last reactor. Uh, she has her hand up. Uh, Flora? Yes, thank you, Teresa. Uh, for me, I really inspired by the sharing of Melly and Sister Michelle, uh, how I uh, really need to have exposure to have a dialogue of life. But actually, I have a question uh, to Sister Michelle, but I got the answer from my group discussion. It's about what's the challenge to, uh, what is the challenge during the exposure to have a dialogue of life. But our group sharing really give me inspired, uh, give me the answer also that we really need to letting go from our comfort zone. Sometimes I just sit in the office or in the center so I know nothing about outside. So it is really uh, to have the exposure. So thank you, Sister Michelle and Melly. Thank you so much, Flora. Thank you. Um, we will we will wrap up for today. We will wrap up for today. And there are many um, responses in the chat group. There are many responses in the chat group. And I invite you to scroll through the chat group and have a look, you know. Uh, we have from Sashi here, Good Shepherd Strategic Planning to include collaboration with other NGOs to provide job opportunities for survivors and continue the position papers, contribute to the position papers. Um, we need to address um, this at the Asia Pacific level as poverty has been uh, exacerbated uh, or rather intensified by the pandemic that will push more women into forced migration. Um, you know, in, in this uh, COVID 19 environment, many women um, who are prostituted are hidden. How is this situation in Pattaya? This question from Dell, yeah. Um, and we have here that we should work with men and boys as well. And from January in Australia, in 30 years, each woman in prostitution uh, was there uh, because she needed the money, need to offer other work or address systemic poverty. So when we look at the responses that have come in, obviously we cannot just work with the prostituted girl or women. We need to address the entire system that surrounds the person. And this is the right space approach. And if we hear from Michelle, it is not the Good Shepherd institution that's in the middle, but it is the situation of the woman that is in the middle. And how do we work together with them to find a solution for uh, women who have been prostituted? And with that, I want to thank you for your participation. I think it has been a very rich sharing um, the next discussion that we will have will be on um, 28th of August, 28th of August, where we will come together for the position paper on economic justice. And today we have heard so much about livelihood opportunities, addressing poverty, giving alternative uh, livelihood options to girls and women, and how do we listen to the needs of the times? How do we bring ourselves up to, you know, um, prostitution that's happening online today? How do we teach women and girls to use social networking in an empowering way for themselves? And how do we keep, uh, how do we teach people to keep safe 
within the social networking environment. Yeah. So come for the next one, which is on economic justice, 28th of August. Yeah. Um, and with that, I want to thank everyone. And um, I will un ask you all to unmute. Uh, say bye bye. Thank you for your participation. We will send bye. the slides bye. out. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.